Hello, it's Wednesday again, so that must mean it's time for another episode of our wonderful wedding podcast. First of all, thank you so much to everyone who listened and fed back on our interview with Holly and James uh, last fortnight. We loved it and it seems like you loved it just as much as we did. They are a wonderful couple and so I'm so glad that it went down as well as it did, although we knew it would. But today we've got an equally fabulous guest, and that is Lisa Vine. Lisa is an LGBTQ inclusivity advisor. She advises businesses from all sectors about how to be more inclusive. She's also planning her own wedding. So it was really interesting and insightful to not only hear her knowledge as an expert and trainer, but also as a consumer and a woman planning her own LGBTQ wedding. We've asked her all sorts of questions and she came up with so many insightful and helpful answers. So if you're planning your LGBTQ wedding, I think you'll find this super inspirational. But if you're a wedding supplier or work in the industry, this podcast is also incredibly useful for you to ensure that your business is being inclusive and welcoming to couples who identify as part of the LGBTQ community. As ever, if you love this podcast, don't forget to subscribe so that you're the first to hear each episode every other Wednesday morning and rate and review it on your podcast listening app of choice. We'll be back in two weeks' time with another incredible guest. But in the meantime, let's enjoy the wisdom and wonderfulness of Lisa Vine. Hello, Lisa. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us on our podcast this morning. Can you tell everyone who you are and why you think we've asked you on the show? Oh, that's the latter of that is interesting. Um, But yes, um, thank you, Ross and Heidi for having me. Uh, My name is Lisa. Uh, My pronouns are she and her and I am an LGBT plus advocate, consultant and trainer based in Leicestershire. Um, So I very broadly, and it is very broad, um, support public, private and third sector organisations as they strive for LGBT plus inclusion. Um, Lots of people, so I started my own business about three years ago in this field, although I have, um, sorry, three years ago? Yes, two and a half years ago. Um, But actually, um, lots of people at times have said to me, oh, you know, I think you should go really niche, like do something really specific within it. Um, But actually, it is really broad because there are lots of organisations that need different kinds of support in this. Sure. Um, so it isn't really a one size fits all approach and it varies by organisation. But just to give you a few examples, um, I'm a guest lecturer at De Montfort University. So I deliver um, LGBT plus inclusivity lectures to student midwives and student nurses. That's very bespoke to kind of the environment they're working and how they can be inclusive of um of people who are having a baby and patients and things. Um, And I deliver Loughborough University's trans and non-binary drop-in support and advice service for their students. And I'm working with Loughborough College and also um, a housing organisation to develop a trans and non-binary inclusion policy and procedure. And that's just a couple of examples of what I do. Um, But I think also I've recently um, being, well, I'm supposed to have been married now several times. Um, But as a... (laughs) As a gay woman, I um, was supposed to get married in 2020 and we've now postponed to 2022. Um, And I realised very early on that some of the experiences we were having with potential suppliers weren't as, um, uh, well, they weren't necessarily allies of LGBT plus people or had an outward prejudice um, or just weren't very inclusive. Um, And so last year I put on some um, online training sessions for wedding suppliers because my other half, Laura, um, who's also a wedding videographer, so it kind of all feeds into the wedding industry. nicely, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) She said, why don't you put on some training? And I was like, oh, well, you know, I've not not really worked in the wedding industry before. And she kind of gave me that look, you know, that only your future spouse can, that sort of said, (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, please, a lot of what you will deliver will overlap around inclusive language, um, around kind of what different identities mean. And she said, actually, we've had experience as a lesbian couple who are looking to, to um, buy things for our wedding or um, uh, employ, sorry, suppliers and things. And she said, actually, a lot of that, you've got those kind of, you know what the barriers and challenges are. And so actually I put on a couple of online training sessions last year. Um, so yeah, so I think in answer to your question in a very wordy way, that's why you've invited me onto the show. Absolutely, today. yeah, we, we <laughs> try and have a, we call our podcast inclusive, don't we? And that's where it sort of came from. And it started with my book, which is very much uh, written for couples like yourself that sort of went to wedding fairs or started planning their wedding. They were like, we don't, you know, it's not inclusive or we don't see ourselves represented. Um, and then that turned into a podcast and then Heidi got on board and obviously Heidi's got a daughter who has Down syndrome. So she's very passionate from a, a disability inclusivity angle. Um, and so we've always been inclusive and we've always sort of done episodes on the premise that whatever advice our guests give it, it has to be relevant for all couples or for, you know. Um, but then this season, we've sort of really want to hone in on, on those couples uh, and individuals who, like you say, don't feel they get the support and the service um, that they deserve and that they should have on what should be a really exciting time. So, yeah, we, we saw what you were doing online and um, obviously know about you through several different groups. And we just thought, let's learn from Lisa. And uh, that's we we very much come from a Absolutely. we're here to learn. Yeah. We don't know everything. And I think. What do you think, Heidi? Absolutely. And and Ross and I have had these conversations about asking questions and not being afraid um, mm -hmm. for businesses who who do uh, supply and support couples who are planning their their weddings to not be afraid to um, ask questions and be led by your couples and. Um, yeah, I, th I think I think um, a lot of the time, and I don't know if you found this, Lisa, doing your training. I think a lot of the time there's a real will to do the right thing, um, but there isn't the knowledge and understanding, and not, there's a certain amount of fear around doing the wrong thing. Have you found that? Absolutely, and actually, I have found that. So I think really weird to think about it because it blows my own mind I think I've trained in the last six years about 2,000 people oh my god um, which is just mind-blowing and not obviously not all from the wedding industry but they've been from health and social care they've been from the police um, GPs teachers people in educational settings um, private organizations private business and actually that is a similar kind of theme across all of them that people constantly say to me, I really want to do the right thing. I honestly don't really know what that looks like. And I'm so terrified of getting it wrong that often I don't really say anything. Um, and actually, I think that can it comes from such a place of positive intention, which I love. But actually, it can leave both parties in this case, in the wedding industry, you know, a supplier and, and, and the couple feeling a bit maybe awkward, not really knowing what's happening. Um, and so I think that is such a, a common theme. And I think, you know, actually, I, I really hope that when I deliver training or workshops to anybody, whoever they are, that if they, they don't have to walk away from it being an expert, but I want them to walk away with some or leave that session with some confidence to go out and, and put some of the tools I've given them into practice. Um, so yeah, I would agree yeah, with that. I think that that word confidence is, is absolutely key. Um, and I think um, we, can, we can be bound by fear. Um, I have it a lot uh, with my daughter where people say, um, you know, what, what what do I call her? Do I call her um, a Downs or do I call her? And I say, no, you call her Ava because that's her name. Um, but but there, there is there is that sort of, yeah, we, we can be bound by fear. So I think I think that's really key and really crucial to people looking for this kind of training is that you give them confidence. Um, have you got any sort of um, real life examples of where you feel um, that perhaps you and your partner have been very well supported or included when, when planning your wedding? Uh, absolutely. I wish I could be like, no, it's, <laughs> it's been great. Um, <laughs> I 
so um there was it's been a real mixed bag I have to say um and you know Vicky Clayson um who's our photographer she was fantastic and there's been a few people who have been absolutely brilliant so it's not all it's not and I use this phrase a lot doomy gloomy it's not all doomy gloomy but there was quite a few times um so we were I mean it seems so odd now because of the pandemic but we wandered into Loughborough where I live and Laura's like should we just like should we just go to some ring shop like jewelry shops and see if we could speak to someone about getting wedding rings because we better do that haven't we and I was like yeah probably it's quite important um for us it's important anyway so we just did like and it seems weird to think about it with the pandemic but just wandering in sort of anywhere now really but we wandered in to this one shop in Loughborough um and we uh, we said to the person oh we'd, we'd really like to to um look at, at, at wedding rings and she sort of looked up at us and like looked at me and then looked at Laura and looked back at me and just went oh um you're gonna have to look in the window now obviously I don't know what's what's going on you know there was no one else in there so she wasn't serving anybody else is she having a bad day has somebody died like you know is it that she's just experiencing anxiety in her own life and and is struggling to cope with customers maybe but I can't help but think as someone who's part of the LGBT plus community you saw me and Laura we said we were getting married you've perceived us as two women and you've thought I don't know what to do with this situation (laughs) or worse it's not just that you don't know what to do that you don't want us in your shop and you don't want anything to do with us because you know we're like we're, we're gay we don't like what if you catch gay from us and I know that sounds you know I'm not a pessimistic person but it you know we left the shop and I was like okay like on to the next one then um but so that was a bit stressful a little bit um yeah, yeah. and then even um and our florist is incredible and we love our florist um and we did call her out on this in a nice way calling someone out sounds negative like you know politely and she was really apologetic and brilliant but even after we'd met her in person so we'd gone to her shop and she'd sort of talked to us about what we might want and she'd made loads of notes um when she sent us the contract um there was a couple of points in the contract where it said like bride and groom and I just I thought oh no like (laughs) I thought you were doing so well like come on <laughs> and it's such a small thing but I think I want to be seen and heard for who I am actually like and I've like I'm paying you money like so like see me come on we've met in yeah. person you know um and actually I did I did give her a call and I just you know said um I've noticed that the contract there's a couple of bits in it where it says bride, bride and groom um, like if you could just change that to to the couple or or and I gave her some examples um and she was like oh Lisa I'm so sorry like I just sent you out the generic contract but that's it right there the generic mm. generic documentation and and I get it like heterosexual you know straight cisgender couples are the majority so I get that but, you know, same-sex marriage was passed in 2013 and it's time to get on the LGBT plus inclusivity train. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. totally. And I, th- I think, I think um, things like that, um, so, so planning a wedding should be the most exciting and joyful and uplifting experience because um, it's probably the biggest celebration um, a couple will experience. Um, and so that that whole process should be joyful. And and it just it break it does break me a little bit when people do say things like you know. And I experienced a situation where my my planning experience was broken up. It, you know, it was it was made to feel less because that's that's not what you expect in in, in anything. You know, even in, in sort of you know going to the shops in day-to-day life <laughs> you know you expect good service and you expect people to be um willing to help and kind and thoughtful and, mm-hmm. and that's that's what you expect of the service industry you do expect good service so it, do, it does sort of yeah it does hurt so so what if if, if 
people recognize that in their own businesses, Lisa, if, if they think, oh my goodness, you know, I've, I've still got contracts that, that, that say bride and groom, or, you know, I still, um, oh, I'm just trying to think of other examples where you might not be, or, well, you know, where you just look shocked when, when a same sex couple walk into your shop or contact you. Um, if, if somebody's recognizing that in their own um, business, what what would you recommend as the first thing for them to do to sort of improve the situation? What what would be the first thing that they should go away and do? I think it's look at um, your. I mean, oh, there's loads. There's loads to, that they could do, Heidi. So I'm just trying to think of like not the most important ones, but maybe some easier ones to put on the top of your list. I think it's look at your documentation and do. Is it is it inclusive of LGBT plus people? So do you use gendered language? If so, where possible, just completely remove it, actually, I think. Um, and, you know, for even things like, or language that is not applicable to LGBT plus people. So for example, and actually it was at the florist, when we were at the florists, there was another document that she was filling out that said about, you know, where, our ceremony was and, and where our event like if we had a separate venue and, and just things like that I think so she could work out timing mileage etc fine but it actually said church and I saw her cross it out because of course same-sex marriages and obviously there's more to LGBT plus inclusive weddings than just same-sex marriages but same-sex marriages aren't legal in churches so even that it's like I would have like maybe ceremony venue rather than church because also there'll be people there'll be other people from you know different religious backgrounds different who have different beliefs and values who won't be getting married in a church anywhere um so it's little things like that have a look at your language do you refer to bride and groom um and and do you refer like do you just talk about church because churches because actually that's not applicable either and I think that that's probably a really good starting point and I would look at that language as well on like on your website as well so obviously those are kind of internal documents that you then share with a, a couple once they're sort of in that stage with you but actually if I was to I've done it if I look for a wedding supplier and I go on their website and it just talks about bride and groom the whole time no matter how amazing they look I think mm, I don't want to give you my hard-earned money actually because I'm not being represented on your website and I'm not visible I can't see myself mm. um so I think yeah look at initially look at your documentation and look at, at whether there's inclusive language and that inclusive language you know it doesn't have to it doesn't have to say like lesbian couple bisexual couple like it doesn't have to say that but actually if you use neutral language it's possible that it represents everyone mm. um so I'd start there but then you need to have a look at your um like your website and your social media pages and your kind of external facing um, presence actually. And how are you, um, are you using inclusive language on there? Do you have um, imagery or video that is um, representative of LGBT plus people as well? Yeah, okay. And you obviously you mentioned things like uh, the church, you know, venue instead of church and things like that. And I think weddings do, so they are still a little bit, stuck in a really old fashioned tradition. And I just wondered, obviously you've trained other sort of industries as well. Where do you think weddings sit in comparison, not that we should compare, but in comparison to sort of some of the other sort of companies and organizations that you work for, do you think weddings are still a little bit sort of further behind society and, and other workplaces in terms of inclusivity? I definitely think if I had to pick whether they're ahead or behind, Again, I'm not a doobie gloomy person, but I would say behind, definitely. Um, I think I think as well, like if you think about, I mean, there's so much to this, but if you think about representation of LGBT plus people, so many like businesses, suppliers, wedding directories and, and stuff, a lot of them are called, like the name of their business is, is bride something or something bride. Yeah. And, and again, I get that. Um, you know, I understand why this might be, you know, stereotypically, there's, there's not, of course, anymore, but stereotypically, there's always been, in terms of weddings, bride and groom, bridesmaids, groomsmen, you know, it's very heteronormative, it's very cisnormative. And also, 
historically and stereotypically perhaps brides are the ones you expect to be organizing everything so I totally understand why people might have that um but I think I think also like talking about images like it tends there always tends to be kind of pictures of of brides and grooms or or grooms with their groomsmen (laughs) And, and, and it's all very kind of either quite masculine or quite feminine and I think within the LGBT plus community um you know and 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 obviously some people are comfortable with the term queer so the queer community as well there is a, a kind of way of expressing yourself that is quite often outside of that kind sure, of set of masculinity and femininity and you know I've seen it so many times like people advertising um like sparkly converse like for like diamante converse right for like and they'll often advertise it specifically for brides or when they've got oh they're so cute like the little ones for kids yeah it'll be like for your flower girl and I think I know people in my life who have little boys who you know want to wear a dress or like yeah. want to wear a princess outfit and actually marketing's hard at the best of times I am not a pro in any way and so trying to market inclusively to a huge population of people who are very different is not an easy thing I get that but actually like if you're just marketing it in that stereotypical way again where's that kind of LGBT plus visibility I mean even Laura for example I feel like I'm going off on a tangent a little bit. No, 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 um, it's fine. So Laura doesn't want to wear a dress. She was like, I've not worn a dress since I was, it's either 12 or 16, I can't remember. And <laughs> she was like, I don't, I don't, I'm not wearing a dress. And I was like, and I was kind of like, well, of course not. Like, that's, of course you're not. Like, that makes complete sense to me. But trying to find a wedding outfit for Laura, we ended up buying one from, I can't remember the name of the company now, but um, a company in the USA um who do um they kind of label themselves as like and some of them talk about being androgynous and being quite gender neutral but essentially it's cisgender women they tailor kind of trousers and suits and shirts and things for the bodies of cisgender women um because laura's like often suits that are made for for kind of cisgender men um are like they won't fit me because you know so and actually like we had to get it from America um and so but often even suits that Laura says oh you know I don't think the fit would be quite right and you think well you could get maybe a bigger size and take it to a tailor they're always marketed at grooms yeah, yeah. it's not a yeah. um, and all so those I things think- you've gone through most of these couples just take for granted don't they I think that's the yeah. thing yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and even, I mean, just if you don't mind me sharing another little snort. No, no, no. Um, even for me, like, I knew that I wanted to wear, I call it getting my girl on, because actually quite often, <laughs> I should say woman now, I'm 33, um, but I don't, I like to wear makeup occasionally. I like to do my hair occasionally. I like to kind of, you know, if people are having weddings and things like that and I'm a guest, like, I think, oh, I'll get like a nice dress to wear and stuff. And I like to kind of, get my girl on but day to day I'm not particularly like that so when it came to buying a wedding dress I was I was surprised at the level of anxiety that I was feeling about going into the shop but I was thinking it's going to be really pink it's going to be really white it's going to be like there's going to be diamantes everywhere (laughs) like I what if they ask me what my groom's name is and assume that I'm straight and then I say oh actually I'm marrying a woman what if they don't handle that well and then I have to get half naked in the changing room with the lady that's trying to get my wedding dress on and she's feeling awkward because she got it wrong and I feel uncomfortable because she got you know and all this stuff and actually I rang the shop and I actually said I'd love to come in I'm really apprehensive not particularly girly you know I'm a gay woman you know I'm just a bit apprehensive and the nicest lady ever Wendy um she said to me my daughter's gay like you're more than like even if I didn't have a gay daughter you'd be more than welcome here oh. and you know if you want to come and see the shop before your appointment and like see it and experience it you know and then you'll be then you'll know what it's like before you come and maybe you'll feel a bit more comfortable 
lovely That's lovely. amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, but I think that obviously, and again, I've kind of gone off on a tangent. I don't know how helpful this is to, to listeners. But I think, you know, obviously there are, I am a, a gay woman, a lesbian woman, and there will be, I mean, I know lots of lesbian or gay women who are very girly and won't have those anxieties. And obviously I'm not in any way suggesting that all lesbian women are, are, are really masculine and, and I'm not at all. So those, so those, some of those anxieties won't necessarily be there for, for lesbian women and, and perhaps that's just my experience. Um, but they are things that I think perhaps not all, but some, you know, cis women don't don't have to kind of worry about or think about. But I think that the kind of masculinity and femininity of the industry, um, I think, does add some additional potentially barriers and challenges or anxieties for, um, you know, for LGBT plus people. Definitely. Do you see improvements, Lisa? Do you do you think that things are getting better? The representation representation is better or are you still seeing predominantly representations of marriage which are those traditional representations um I think things are improving and the reason I'd also say that is because I think the expectations of wedding days are changing as well I think lots of people you know some people don't have a cake they don't have speeches Um, maybe they don't even exchange rings maybe they you know they don't have people walk they don't do the the whole walking down the aisle thing um you know maybe they don't have sit down three course meals anymore and they want to just have like street like food like vans turn up and you can have and like people have games at their weddings like you, you know you play games and and, and like someone had a silent disco like that we filmed a wedding for. And I think that, I think there's still an expectation of doing a wedding a certain way, but I think because generally as well, I think society is starting to branch out and be um, a bit more um, or, or less of what was expected previously historically, um, that actually that's also kind of paved the way for not paved the way, that's wrong, but LGBT plus people getting married, you know, might not have some of those traditions or may not want some of those traditions that, um, you know, cisgender heterosexual couples have. Um, and so actually, I think I think there's a diversity within the industry generally, um, which is kind of supporting with that. Um, but then, you know, having said that, an additional story. So we went to a wedding fair Laura went to a wedding fair and I went to help her as a videographer again pre-pandemic and uh, there was a, a DJ there a supp- another supplier and you know as you do came over to chat to us and whatever and Laura's banner for her videography she's got like a pull-up banner just has pictures of um, rings on it and I think some like flowers and stuff um, because you know she was like I don't want people on it unless I can represent lots of people mm. I don't people on it because it won't be inclusive and I was like yeah great you know um and this DJ came over and he just he kind of stood there with his legs apart and his arms folded <laughs> and he kind of said oh <laughs> we've all met them there's yeah. loads of them around sadly and, and he went well you know what you want to do you know and I thought not I'm not really interested but go on <laughs> like I didn't say that to him I just thought okay let's give him a chance I've just met him and he said you need a picture of the bride uh, I was like, I was like, okay, yeah. And he was like, bride sell, you know. And I was like, oh yeah, right. I've heard that. And I was like, but I was like, what if there aren't brides? And he kind of went, <laughs> and he just didn't know what to say. But like, also, what I also find fascinating is when, like, a classic example of language that isn't inclusive is the bride and the groom, because it suggests there's only one. Yeah, yeah. Which by default means that you're not expecting there to be a, a same as as the government language same-sex yeah. marriage um you know and similarly I filled out a, a, a survey during the pandemic about obviously because I know the wedding industry has just been hit so hard and the the survey like they were collecting data to try and give to the government about what people needed and wanted and and stuff um and because we've had to postpone twice I you know I thought I'll fill it out because I'm included in this and it was really inclusive until the end and it just said are you the bride or are you the groom and I was like 
<laughs> well, I'm not the bride because there's more than one and I'm not the groom. And I actually wrote a response really politely. Um, like, And of course, you can never tell someone's um, tone of voice or perhaps how they intend it when it's written. Fair enough. And I did. I just put smiley faces in and I was very like, you know, just a thought and, you know, kind of thing. Wasn't pushy at all. And I got a response that was like, oh, well, we did discuss that prior to putting the survey out and we decided it was inclusive. And I was like, God. okay, no, like, I, don't, I don't know how to fight that now because you're not, yeah. I've offered some wisdom and I was very polite and friendly about it and you kind of dismissed me and shot me down. So I'm going to take, I'll just take my energy elsewhere. Yeah. 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 Do I you think feel- I think but it's interesting, Lisa, what you said about um, uh, phone, phoning ahead and, and asking whether or not um, a, 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 a wedding dress shop is an inclusive environment. Um, and does it make you sad that you feel that, that, that you have to do that? Or do you think that's a positive thing to do that and make yourself feel comfortable in advance? That, Heidi, is a very interesting question because I think that's not just applicable to the wedding industry. That's, and this probably says something about me and my own personality and my own insecurities and my background, but actually that, to a certain extent, that's kind of my whole life. So when you ask me, does that make me feel sad? My gut reaction was, well, no, because it's just part and parcel of life. I totally relate to that. I can totally yeah. relate to that. Yeah. Like, and, you know, like even, I mean, this is by the by, really, but like even like six years ago, five years ago, when I went um, abroad with my then, well, now ex-girlfriend, um, we stayed in a hotel before we flew um, to Canada uh, near Gatwick because it was a really early flight. Being in Leicestershire, it's quite far. And, you know, we booked a hotel room in advance. And when I got there to check in, the man at reception looked at me and looked at my ex and went, would you like a twin room? Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, um, and like, to be fair, like maybe, maybe he thinks we're sisters. All right, fine. But would you, would he have said that? And actually I watched him after me in the queue was, I was going to say, would he have said that to somebody he perceived to be male and female? And there was a youngish man and woman behind us in the queue so then I watched afterwards and he didn't ask them that because he doesn't assume they're brothers and sisters like brother yeah, and sister no. does he and yeah, it's that yeah. Mm. yeah it's not that I would I like I wouldn't necessarily ring ahead now with a hotel like I'd just book it and then you know and in that instance I was like actually no I'd got like a double room please and he was all like oh uh, okay <laughs> but, it- but I guess like you were saying Heidi about it being when you're planning a wedding it, it's you want it to be all the, for all the stress that it is, because it, you know, it is it is stressful times. You know, actually, you want those kind of moments when you're picking food and dresses and or like or outfits. My my case, a dress, but outfits. When you're picking decorations, if you want decorations, whatever you're picking for your day, you want it to be exciting and you want it to totally. be inclusive. And so, did I feel sad that I had to ring? No, because it's so part of nor- my normality, but it did make me feel loads better. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, yeah. and actually, I think Wendy, bless her, actually felt quite a rapport with me <laughs> because <laughs> when I came in, I think she just sort of oddly saw me like her own daughter. And then I was, when I went in for my second appointment to try on other dresses because I didn't get a dress the first time, she came down the stairs because she was helping somebody else and I was with her colleague and I was wearing the dress I then bought. And she just went, she put her hands on the side of her face and she just went, oh, my baby. <laughs> <laughs> and then two oh, random people, lovely. two random women, like, wandered in for their appointment and were like, you look amazing. Are you buying that one? And I was like, I am now. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there were positives in that. In But should I have to share my vulnerability? Exactly, yeah. Probably not. Was it my choice and did it make me feel better? Yes. Um, you know, and, and the wonderful Brene Brown, I can't remember, like she's a psychologist, academic amazing type. She has a podcast too. She always talks about how important it is to be vulnerable. So, but you know, people shouldn't have to, I don't think people should have to phone ahead. 
Um, Not at all. But it, I think it's really important that, that you have been vulnerable and you have shared that because I get a lot of people when I say, oh, you know, I, I photograph all types of couples, but I do make a point of being inclusive because that's my experience. And people say to me, oh, well, it's all fine. Now. Do you really need to like niche or do you really need to specialise in LGBT couples? Because it's all OK. And, and, and it's only straight couples that say that. And they mean it with the best will in the world, because I think in their mind, it never crosses their mind that they would be non-inclusive. So they just think, well, everyone's inclusive now. You're legally allowed to get married. It must be fine. And no LGBTQ couple that I've met have said to me, oh, you don't really need to specialise. You don't really need to niche. You don't really need to speak to us, to, you know, us as a group. Because I, I get it. And, and I think I said to you before, you know, I've got a page on my website that's about LGBTQ inclusion. And a bit like what you were saying earlier, you don't want to be doom and gloom. But I've also wanted to say, I get that a lot of, a lot of your experience takes the shine off having to, you know, reading about bride and grooms all the time or being asked if you're marrying each other or whether you're best friends or, or whatever. You know, you don't want to talk about it as sort of, it's all horrible and it's all frustrating because it's it's still an amazing time, like you say. But it, there is that extra layer that I think people assume isn't there anymore, and it's still very much, very much is. I think. Yeah. And even, I mean, there's, there's so, I could say even small things. There are so many things, but even things for me like we're getting married at, at a community hall in in Leicestershire, in a, in a village in Leicestershire, because we don't we wanted a venue that was just ours we don't have a budget to have a big venue exclusively and there are some amazing venues out there obviously as you both know but I am I said to Laura I was like I don't want anybody commenting like I don't want anybody I, I just don't want any of that negativity for one day <laughs> so I was yeah. like I would rather have a a small, you know, it's got like a lawn area um, and, you know, the, the hall has, it has an amazing wooden floor and it's all white and there's loads of windows and it's really airy and lovely. And it's, you know, it's fine for what we need it to be. But I know that the only people who will be there are people that I've invited because I don't, I don't want people to shout anything on the day or, or, you know, not be inclusive. Yeah, um, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, because it is it is that day, that day that we were talking about, that day of joy, of celebration, of union, yeah. of being with the people you love and supported. And so I absolutely understand that. And it only takes sort of, sorry, one sort of waiter that's been brought in for the day to make a comment or make a funny look. And then and then that's what's what you remember for the rest when you look back on your wedding, isn't it? That one comment or that one person that sort of you know is looking at you as if you're different from the norm kind of thing yeah or even I mean different I think as well like if someone was looking and was maybe surprised or like if it didn't come from a place of prejudice I mean that that's fine but just not for one just day especially it, no. one expensive day like yeah <laughs> but it's always a, from a place of prejudice and and, and I and I argue this about disability you know, if somebody says, ah, when they, when they meet my daughter, you know, a lot of people would say, um, oh, but they, you know, they're not being horrible to your daughter when they meet her. They just, you know, ah, um, and, and, but, but, but nobody would, ah, an 18 year old woman who didn't have a disability, would they? You wouldn't sort of go up to an 18 year old in the street who didn't have a disability and go, are at them mm. but they do it to my daughter because she has a disability I know they're not being intentionally mean to her and and I would never say that's that's what was going on there but equally it does come from a place of prejudice it is that kind of infantilizing of somebody that has a disability it is that not really understanding that a couple are a couple um you know uh, that that you know just as traditional weddings, you know, are, are, are treated as a as a place of union and love, then then all all unions should be treated that way. So I, although I I do know that people aren't being mean and horrible when they unintentionally present their prejudices, I do think certainly businesses um, have a responsibility to make sure that that waiter 
doesn't give you a funny look and you aren't offered twin beds and uh, you know you aren't addressed as the bride. Um, so I, I do think Lisa what you're doing offering this training is really important and I do think I hope that most people in our industry in the wedding industry are, are looking to, to fulfill those those obligations are you know making sure that that nobody who comes to them to celebrate their wedding is made to feel a bit a bit icky and a bit uncomfortable. I, I would I'm told... oh, sorry go on Russ. No I was just going to say in your experience uh can you tell um, when it genuinely comes from a place of wanting to be inclusive and when you f it's a little bit performative or tokenistic? Have you had that sort of um, flip of it? If you haven't, you haven't. That's great. I don't want to sort of put no, I, on your mind. I think from my experience, I think people have, have tried their best, even when they've got it wrong. Yeah. And they have where I've challenged them, you know, like our florist, I've like very politely challenged her as well, because I know that it didn't, I felt it didn't, my gut feeling was it didn't come from a place of deliberate prejudice or anything. So I've challenged her very politely. Um, you know, those, those people in those situations, they've really owned it. Obviously, you know, the lady in the ring shop, I just <laughs> thought I, I'm not going to, I can't waste my energy. Like perhaps I, and perhaps I should given the, my business and what I do but actually Laura and I wanted to have a nice day ordering our wedding rings and I thought do you know what today I'm yeah. just gonna yeah not gonna have my money and I'm gonna walk away um I think so I think it's interesting what you say about people being tokenistic and I think that falls sometimes in with like um a, perhaps a little bit around assumptions or yeah. like examples people give so like if some a potential supplier says, oh, well, we did do a gay wedding and, um, you know, we like venues, for example, have, and I've heard stories where they've said, you know, we just, you know, we can sort out rainbow flags for you. Oh. <laughs> oh. Right. Now, obviously, some people, right, might want lots of rainbow flags and a rainbow cake and, you know, I don't know, like rainbow bunting and rainbow cocktails and, and like rainbow, you know, different multicolored glasses and stuff or something, right? But I think, you know, just because the rainbow is a symbol of LGBT plus identities and, and progression and activism and all those things, and it is very important, don't get me wrong, like that, that feels like quite a tokenistic thing to say. Yeah. Like, oh, we can do your gay wedding. We'll get you some rainbow flags. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, you know, and, and also if you think about LGBT plus inclusivity, I think I alluded to it earlier. Actually, it's not just about gay or lesbian couples. If we think about trans and non-binary people, so non-binary people who don't, um, whose gender identity isn't, they don't feel that it's what they were assigned at birth and also isn't within the gender binary of male and female. So non-binary will mean different things to different people, but essentially somebody might not align with any gender identity, may feel that they are, um, so, so in essence, they would call themselves perhaps agender, so they don't have any gender identity. Other people might feel that sometimes they're male and then sometimes they're female or may feel both male and female. It's very, um, kind of a diverse almost umbrella term in itself but non-binary identity it isn't legally recognized in the UK in terms of you can't um, get a gender recognition certificate to change your birth certificate to non-binary um, so actually you know people who are non-binary won't be able to legally get married um, as the gender identity they know themselves to be but they may still decide they want to um, you know, for the benefit of the, like, I don't know, perhaps for, um, you know, the financial benefits it, it is to get married, perhaps because they want to have that special day. And actually, I think, I don't know if suppliers would even consider that, like the barriers and challenges that might come with that and how they could play a part in um, diminishing some of those um, as well. Um, and then, as, you know, if you think about um, trans, transgender people or trans people, who um, were assigned one gender when they were born, but as they've they've grown up, they actually um, 
identify with the other binary gender, um, then actually, you know, thinking about thinking about a shop to buy a wedding dress, if you know, would do trans women generally feel comfortable going into a, a, a wedding dress shop and and feeling confident and like they're going to be accepted? I've worked a lot with the trans and non-binary community. Um, on a, a, initially on a BBC Children's Need project supporting trans and non-binary youth, and I speak from working with them and their experiences. I don't, I don't think they would. Similarly, you know, a, a trans man who, um, you know, perhaps has had top surgery, so has scar tissue, or maybe hasn't had top surgery and is wearing a binder, which suppresses your um, your chest, so it looks it looks flat and helps with gender dysphoria and all. And all of these things and helps to present in a, in a masculine way you know if, if you wanted to buy a suit say you might not but if you did uh, you know how is going in mm. uh, as a groom and 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 you know maybe having to get changed and you know all of those things and um you know making sure you don't get misgendered on your wedding day um and all of those things so there's so many things to think about as well I think that are beyond and I say just very loosely and not flippantly, but just kind of lesbian and gay couples as well. Do you think it's um, a, a case of giving people the opportunity to uh, flag up how best to include them? Um, I, I, I'm only saying this because I um, arranged um, a, a photo shoot a few weeks ago with um, a photographer that I've worked with a few times um, and our models uh, were a lesbian couple, a, a real couple um, and one of the models um, also had autism and because my daughter has a dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism um, one of the first things I wanted to know were um, you know, did she have any um, anxiety triggers that we needed to be aware of on the shoot? Um, and she told us she did. So I made sure that everybody on the shoot was aware of her triggers and that there would be times during the day where she might need to step back and just have a little bit of time and space away from everybody doing a hair, doing a makeup, touching a body, you know, because that sensory overload was going to be too much for her. And at the end of the day, she said to us, you know, really autism um, is nothing unless people place those kind of restrictions and um, basically box us in. But if people um, are understanding and give time and, and space for people to say, okay, this is who I am. This, these are the things that cause me anxiety. Um, then, you know, it's almost kind of for both parties, I think, for both um, businesses and wedding suppliers and those seeking out those services because you both know that you're giving one another the space and time to do the right things and and make it an enjoyable experience mm -hmm. so is it Lisa is it about sort of you know making people aware I mean a lot of the things that you were saying then I, I was sat here thinking well I'd never really considered that I'd never really considered what it would be uh, to support somebody planning their wedding uh, who um, was, was gender fluid. Um, you know, I, I think about same sex weddings and, but, I, but, but yeah, I don't, I've, I've never really thought about supporting somebody um, who was transgender. So yeah, is, is, it, is it sort of, you know, being kinder to, to, to each other as, as those looking for the supplier and, and those providing the service, do you think? I think, and I'm all for this in my general life anyway, I'm, I think it's about meeting people's needs. And I think, you know, I wouldn't necessarily like it. Again, it would come from a place of positive intention, but I wouldn't like if somebody, if a supplier turned to me and said, right, Lisa, you're a lesbian with Laura. I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> um, and then they'd be like, what, what can we do prior to the day and on the day um, that's going to make you going to make you feel more comfortable like that is probably not the best way of going about that but I think all human beings are individuals regardless of identities labels everything and so actually you know it's the same it's a bit weird to think about but same in my business if I'm delivering training I don't deliver the same thing to everyone I'm going to ask that organization what are your needs how can I fit this training program 
to meet your needs as an organization and actually I think you know if a supplier said to me and Laura okay so the days you've told me it's broadly looking like this is there anything in particular that you think you might need some additional support with is there anything that you're worried about is there anything that I can do as your wedding photographer as your makeup artist that is going to support you to have the best possible day and actually knowing Laura she'd go I'm a massive introvert and I'm actually just going to need a little bit of downtime and might not even mention anything about sexuality or gender identity but it opens up those opportunities for people to go oh look someone's seeing me I feel valued I feel like I'm being seen I feel important like actually yeah I do have a couple of things that I'd like to talk to you about and then that gives them that space, but it's not specific to sexuality. It's not specific to gender identity. But again, like similarly, and I'm, I'm conscious of time. I don't want to keep you for too long. Um, but, um, you know, similarly, like when people, you know, I've heard wedding suppliers before, like, um, like or event, I guess event organisers who say, okay, so will your dad be walking you down the aisle? Somebody might not have a dad. Mm. You know, actually, what if someone has two mums? and you know or someone might not have a dad um their dad might have um disowned them because of their sexuality or gender identity and actually probably the most inclusive way is is by asking actually do you want to sort of come down the aisle in front of all your guests have you thought about that would you like to stand at uh, or like be at the front actually because somebody might not be able to stand be at the front you know and and be there first have you thought about that and then if someone says oh actually yes um I would like to walk down the aisle okay you'd like to walk down the aisle like, is there anybody that you want to walk down the aisle with yeah, yeah. you know it's things like that and I, I think uh, of I don't want to overwhelm all your listeners and I think oh that Lisa Vine like there's so much to think about but actually these small things and there may be a lot of them and it may seem overwhelming but actually they can make such a huge difference yeah like, definitely I think I think it comes back to taking away all those assumptions, isn't it? I think there are so many assumptions we lump on someone's sexuality or their gender or or, or anything, really. I mean, even as a photographer, um, I have couples of all shapes and sizes, you know, and it's it's not, you know, I have I have sort of couples that are quite uh, plus size or, or or however they define themselves, and they love the camera, you know, and there's photographers that would assume, you know, that they'd want to be made to look smaller or, you know, sort of, hide them behind something or slim them down or you know and I have couples that seemingly have bodies that you know the social media would say is very love island or or whatever and they're really self-conscious and there's loads of parts of them that they don't like so it's 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 getting rid of all those assumptions isn't it and and just treating people like individuals I think yeah and I think it's it's okay sorry it's okay to get it wrong as well yeah I think if you're I'm all for pie. I'm always talking about pie. Positive intention and empathy. If you mean well and you can empathise with someone's situation, so obviously Heidi was giving examples earlier where someone actually is being quite prejudiced and they mean well, but are they really empathising with with that person? Probably not. But if you can, if you can, if you're open to kind of seeing and hearing the barriers and challenges that people have or concerns that people have and then you try your hardest to kind of lessen those or get rid of them in the first place then actually if you get it wrong I think people can really see that positive intention and that empathy um, or hear it in in your in your tone of voice or or whatever and actually then you know you you can just say do you know what I'm really sorry you know what would have been the better thing to do or what would have been a better thing to say and actually I think it's about if you get it wrong just own it yeah yeah you know, as well, because, you know, I everyone says to me, oh, you know, like, especially all my family, because I, I used to work in like politics and stuff as well. And I was actually in Parliament when same sex marriage was debated oh, wow. and through and it was amazing. But, you know, they're always like, oh, I bet you know everything about being politically correct. Firstly, I hate the phrase politically. Yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, but, um, but, you know, there were going to be times, going to be times even when I get it wrong. And actually, I am open to learning and I will apologise for that and I will correct myself and I will try and get it right. Because I think only in those moments can we really be truly inclusive, because I don't there's going to be very few people out there who can really be truly inclusive of everybody. 
without making mistakes and only through doing and making those mistakes can we learn um yeah so interestingly lisa um the the sort of like last question that we were going to ask is if if there's one thing that listeners can take away from our conversation today what would it be and i think pi i like pi positive intention and empathy i think that's that's a great takeaway yeah yeah definitely and i think also um i think the other like yeah and being open to to challenge and and reflect on what people tell you and make those changes um but i think if you are an lgbt plus person or part of the community who's planning your wedding or even an event um i didn't mention it earlier but trans and non-binary people sometimes have if they change their name as part of their social transition um then they sometimes have like naming ceremonies um, and so um, celebrants in particular are sometimes being asked to lead those. Um, so I think if, if, you have, if you're planning a wedding or, or an event like a naming ceremony, it shouldn't necessarily always be your responsibility at all. And, but I think if you feel able to, you know, politely challenge and educate those suppliers who do make mistakes. Because like I said before, otherwise people, how will people learn? But I think, you know, only if people feel able to, because not everyone will feel able to do that. But I think also... The reason I think suppliers, you know, sh- I hesitate to use the word should, but <laughs> should be open perhaps to challenge, um, especially polite challenge, is because ultimately in the end, it's going to make you more money <laughs> <laughs> and help build your reputation. And that is not necessarily a good enough reason to be <laughs> LGBT plus inclusive. But actually, if you have a positive experience with an LGBT plus couple or client and then they give you a good review, Maybe they don't, but it's quite likely that they're going to have a lot of LGBT plus friends who then may also want to to get married. Or, you know, like somebody might say to my twin sister, oh, who's who's maybe part of the LGBT plus community might say to Rach, my twin, oh, Lisa got married. Like we're a bit bit worried about suppliers and stuff. Like who did she use? Did she have a positive experience? And so actually, like it can build your reputation as well and then ultimately make you more money so <laughs> that's the other reason why I would say Good but thing. yes pie but I yeah I, th- I agree with that and I also think it says a lot about your values as a person behind the brand doesn't it um I think if the more diverse uh if you've got you know happy happy clients from all different backgrounds it yeah. it's, it says that you you do have those positive intentions and empathy and you do re- make that effort to to reach out to people as well so definitely you've been amazing Lisa we're so glad we we had you on we could we could go on for hours but we won't <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much it's been lovely no yeah. and we wish you all the best for your wedding so when's your wedding not till next year now uh yeah it's not until the third of June next year now okay um so fingers crossed fingers crossed, um, crossed. So where can people find out more about you? Where can they find your um, your training offer and um, contact you? Yeah, so uh, my website is www.lisavine.com. Um, people can email me at lisa at lisavine.com, but I'm also on um, Twitter at Lisa Vine LGBT. I'm on Facebook as well. I'm on Instagram, although I'm not that good at Instagram and I need to improve it. Um, but... <laughs> If, you know, if people want to reach out, you know, I'm always wanting to educate people. So especially if they're oh, educating makes me sound like I think I'm really important. That's not how I mean it to sound. But I want I want to help people, especially yeah. you know, people who are striving for LGBT plus inclusion. I want to help them. So if anyone's got any questions and they want to kind of tweet me or message me or email me, whatever, I'll be, I will reply. Um, and I'm hoping to put on a couple of training sessions um, in the autumn, actually um so keep a look out for those as well yeah and we'll share those whatever whatever you put on we will we will let all our followers know as well yeah definitely thank you so much lisa it's been really really interesting thank you thank you